This season of Threshold is underwritten by the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. It's a summer night, and the kids of Shishmaref, Alaska are on the loose. How are you, Walter? Good. How's your day? My day is good. How's your day, sir? Good. <laughs> what are you guys playing? We're just playing around. Just playing around. I'm Amy Martin, and this is Walter Knipe. He's 10 years old. What's wrong? Right here on my ribs hurts. I, I ran too much. Uh-huh. He takes a break from this swirling, giggling kid mosh pit to catch his breath and ponder the universal rituals of childhood. Girls are supposed to be chasing us. Why are the girls supposed to be chasing the boys? Because they like them. <laughs> Shishmaref is a small town on a barrier island in northwest Alaska, just shy of the Arctic Circle. About 600 people live here. There's a church, a school, two stores, and around 150 houses connected by a couple of paved roads and footpaths through the sand. This island is tiny, and kids here are pretty free to roam. Tonight, everyone under the age of 15 seems to have spontaneously gathered here, in a wide spot between some houses, to chase each other around in the sand. What's your favorite thing about living in Shishmaref? Mm, it's fun. Why is it fun? Because there's a lot of kids. There are a lot of kids. There's so many kids. And we can be free. Be free. And you can be free. Yeah. From Walter's point of view, Shishmaref is a kind of paradise, a whole island of free-range, kid-friendly habitat. But the paradox of Shishmaref is that it might be both one of the safest and one of the most dangerous places to live in America today. Because this small community is one of the places where climate change is hitting the hardest in the Arctic. Shishmaref is located just north of the Bering Strait. That's the narrow waterway that separates Russia from Alaska. It's the only town on Sarachev Island, and everywhere you go, you can see the waves and hear the constant roar of the ocean. This island is only about a quarter mile wide. That's 440 yards, or less than half a kilometer. And it's getting smaller. It's changed a lot. It was always frozen, like the end of October. It no longer is. This is Kate Kokyok. She grew up here, and now she teaches kindergarten at the Shishmaref School. And she says the sea ice used to serve as a buffer for this little island. It would freeze up in the fall before Arctic storms blew in, which meant that the wind and waves battered the edge of the ice instead of the edge of the island. But now, as the climate warms, sea ice is forming later and later, and waves that used to break far away from the coastline slam directly into Sarachev Island. Like you look outside and you want it to freeze end of October, first part of November, because that's when we start to have our storms, but it hasn't been freezing then. At the same time, the frozen soil or permafrost that the town is built on has been thawing. And the combined effect is that the ocean is essentially eating Shishmaref, mostly in small, relentless nibbles. But every so often, a major storm blows in, and the waves take big, deadly bites out of the coastline. Between 2003 and 2014, Sarachev Island lost an average of 2.3 meters annually. That's seven and a half feet of land washing into the sea each year. We did lose a lot of land. Like where the seawall is now, that's where we used to have our playground. So all of that is gone. You know, I remember in 97, they were emptying out a house because it was shaking and it was undercutting. So they were worried that it was gonna fall over. So during the storm, they were emptying out the house and they lifted it up and moved it a few feet onto the road, <laughs> you know? So that's the one that I remember. I've never been in a place like Shishmaref before where the community's mental map is so different from the current physical map. It's like there's a drowned ghost town ringing the island, full of images and stories. We had lots of room to play out on the beach, play baseball or tag or whatever. You had beach way out there. You know, we had big sand dunes that we'd play on there, jump around. This is Stanley Taktu, the vice mayor of Shishmaref. Taktu, T-O-C-K-T-O-O. -O. I was born in Shishmaref, 1961, uh, July 24. Stanley says decades ago, when he was a kid, the island was twice as wide as it is now. We go way the hell down there, park our boats on the beach, tents out there once in a while. Yeah, you 
but no, it's submerged under the water, so, yeah. This island's only three miles by a quarter mile wide. Yeah, maybe, maybe a little narrower now. Climate change is real, you know. The people of Shishmaref have voted to relocate to the mainland, but they need around $180 million to make the move. And they're not alone. At least 30 other communities in coastal Alaska are in similar situations. And so far, they've had a really hard time getting their needs heard in Washington. I, I can't believe that our president don't believe in climate change, you know. Look at our lifestyle, look at our roads and problems, you know. We're Americans too, you know, we don't have to be treated like a third world country. I've heard something to the effect of these dumb Eskimos. Why did they, uh, why did they build their community on a barrier island? The fact of the matter is because the church and the Bureau of Indian Affairs school was built. So I think that's a major misconception. Kelly Enningwalk grew up in Shishmaref, but she lives in Anchorage now. She's the executive director of the Inuit Circumpolar Council in Alaska, an organization that works to promote and protect indigenous rights in the Arctic. And she says a lot of people don't understand how this community ended up in its current predicament. To begin with, she says, you have to know that one of the best survival tools for people here has always been movement, seasonal migration. So Kelly's ancestors used Sarachef Island, where Shishmaref is located now, but they didn't live there year round. And that's the thing, they were kind of semi-nomadic. Um, we didn't have permanent settlements and that sort of thing. But in the early 1900s, that began to change. The Lutheran Church and the Bureau of Indian Affairs arrived and told people that a church and a school and the ideologies contained within them were moving in to stay. The only question was where to put the buildings. So why is Shishmaref located where it is? It was because the school was built and a church was built. And so the community established and became a permanent uh, village in that way. Most people in Shishmaref identify as a Nupiak. That's a subgroup of the Inuit and they've been living in this part of the world for a really long time, honing the best methods for finding food, making clothing and shelter, and building healthy families and communities in this very harsh environment. Kelly says one of the most painful aspects of colonization is the way it taught people to devalue their expertise and the whole worldview behind it. She grew up with her grandparents and considers her grandfather one of her primary teachers, but... He said himself he was dumb because he only went to junior high. He didn't go to high school. And I mean, gosh, you know, that really kind of hurt inside for me to hear him say that and kind of blew me away. Like, you know, he should have had a PhD in uh, <laughs> everything about life, you know? So it kind of also gave me some insight into kind of, you know, the impact, the colonialization and assimilation that had on his generation and how it brought shame and, and you know, just a level of insecurity, I think, like in, in themselves and the pride in being in a back was lesser. Or I don't know how to explain it. Like it was, it was... Uh, that generation that really got hit hard. They're the ones that were hit with, you know, for speaking in a book. Mm -hmm. um, so. Truly hit hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine that your hometown just suddenly washes away all the grave sites, um, your childhood house, your school, and everybody that you know has to move somewhere else. Krista Sanuk teaches third grade here in Shishmaref. And that threat's really real. And even the little kids are aware of it. If you ask people here if the Arctic is warming, they look at you like, duh. It's a weird question, kind of like standing on the deck of the Titanic, arguing about whether or not there really is a hole in the ship. That debate is utterly detached from the reality of people's lives, and it wastes time when time is of the essence. If you were watching somebody drowning in the ocean, would you just boat by and say, oh, somebody else will save them? You wouldn't do that, so why are you doing it right now with all of these places? Krista moved to Shishmaref in 2012, and she says sometimes her friends from home ask her, 
Why don't people there just move to some other town, like Nome, or Fairbanks, or Seattle? Why are they insisting on relocating the whole village? But Krista says that in Shishmaref, that's basically like telling the community to let their culture go extinct. It's something she had to learn as a white person who grew up in the lower 48. It, it would be like saying, oh sure, um, just abandon America and go to um, Argentina. That would be great, right? And you would be like, it kind of looks the same and it really doesn't feel the same. And you would lose very quickly what makes your culture yours. It would be very easily absorbed into something else. And it's really easy for some people to forget because our culture is prominent. Like my culture is everywhere in America. So it's easy for me to forget that it could be taken apart. And this is a very small specific culture. Anupiak to Shishmaref is only existing here. Anupiak is big, but Shishmaref Anupiak is only existing right here. And if we take it out of Shishmaref, it has the ability to just break apart. I mean, we're talking about climate erosion, eroding away the, the land. It happens to people's cultures too. We got to lose our house. We got no place to go. There's no road to go to the mainland over here, you know. Stanley's on the search and rescue team here. He knows as well as anyone just how bad things could get when that next big storm hits. And he could move out of Shishmaref, get a job in another town, and just leave all of this behind. But he doesn't want to do that. He points out the window to the kids playing outside. We're not trying to make a new home for myself. We're trying to build these things for them so they could have a home and do the tough and lifestyle we have, you know. I went to church services when I was in Shishmaref, and the choir sang this song called Invisible Hands. The lyrics go, invisible hands will keep you from danger. Invisible hands will keep you from harm. The gospel reading that day was Matthew 14, the story of Jesus walking on the water. But here, where the cold Arctic waves are circling this village in an ever tighter noose, people aren't asking for miracles. They're just trying to do what they've always done, stick together. <laughs> 